verifiability, the ability to use cryptography to ensure that all parts of it are correct and to independently guarantee it. And the trusted setup is a rejection of that. I understand why people advocate for it. I understand that at the time, trustless setups would absolutely not be feasible for Zcash. But Monero has perfect amount of privacy. And obviously, ring signatures are not perfect. We can talk about attacks on those for a while as well. But Monero was trustless. So it may not have been the best privacy technically, but it was also private by default and actually had people using the privacy technology and was verifiable. And I respected all of those aspects. To watch the full episode, be sure to subscribe to Monero Talk on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, or Spotify. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. CakeWallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Luke Parker, a talented crypto dev who started working on ETH-related projects at the age of 15, experimented with developing his own nano-like crypto, and ultimately found his way to Monero, notably coding up an implementation of Monero multisig in Rust, and most recently leading the development of Sarai, a deck similar in concept to ThorChain with improvements on what Luke sees as Thor's shortcomings built with Monero integration being the focus. The interview covered much more than an overview of Sarai, so sit back and enjoy part one of introducing Luke Parker to the broader Monero community. Monero Talk starts now. Ready, all right. Luke, what's going on, man? Nothing much. Very excited to be here. First time doing it. Hopefully not the last. Is this your first time uh, doing doing an interview? Uh, yeah, I think so. Awesome, man. Well, we, I'm honored. Thank you. But interview in general, no. Interview within the Monero community, yes. Okay. Because we were both at Monerotopia, and then we were both at Monerocon, but they were such busy events. Like, we got to talk. We did talk. We just didn't have the time to sit down. Yeah, Monerotopia, I don't think we really talked at all. I was just like, I remember just passing right. the same time. <laughs> well, you were kind of running it, so I completely understand. No hard feelings here. And I'll be completely out when I saw, I didn't know who you were. <laughs> what you were you know, I, I, I was like, I had met you, I think, before Monerotopia, though. I met you somewhere else. Uh, I know I reached out at one point when I actually initially did atomic swaps. Okay. I, no, I think we, we met in person. We met in person? Oh, you just seem so familiar. Maybe I just passed you so many times. That you <laughs> <laughs> Always in the background. Hmm. So, um, yep. Yeah, speaking of what is your back? Give us your story, man. As much as you're willing to give, I'd, I'd love to just learn more about you. So around i got into cryptocurrency as a freelancer i was 15 i believe at the time and they don't let you get a paypal account when you're 15. so i was trying out these job boards and they're like great how do you want to get paid and i'm like i can't <laughs> guess i'm not going to be working um and then so i was eventually made my way to an ethereum group and they're like oh yeah we'll just send you money what, what's the issue can you just make an address and it's like wow this is this is a functioning economy. This is a way I can get paid for doing goods and services. That is uh, amazing. So wait, you were 50. So how old are you now? Uh, I'm currently 20. No, I love what you talk about. It was like, you know, decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, five years or so. And then, yeah, it's been a lot. Uh, I ended up working on my own cryptocurrency a bit earlier than I should have. But I knew the parts of it weren't ready. I knew that the project wasn't there. And I kept building it. Unfortunately, I never launched it, but also took no money. So no harm, no foul. And it kind of prepared me to understand all the parts of cryptocurrency from the basic cryptography behind things like Bitcoin to more efficient protocols to 
database work and peer-to-peer -peer layers. And I actually got started with Monero. I always appreciate it from a distance, but in exchange hired me to do an integration. So yeah. I wrote a Monero wallet in Python and it still used the Monero cryptography. I was absolutely not able to replicate that at the time, but I redid the transaction building. I redid the key management, the address handling. And it really just got me started. I went back to my own work, but then the atomic swap paper came out and I'm like, huh, my cryptocurrency also doesn't have support for scripts and also uses ED25519. Can, can I get in on this? <laughs> Which led to ASMR, Atomic Swaps for Meros, my project. And we then integrated both Nano and Monero into it. And that was the first implementation of the protocol, did the first Monero Atomic Swap with it. And that's when I really started to be more of a presence in the Monero community, hang out. And it's just gone from there. Oh, amazing, man. Amazing. <laughs> so wait, what what was the crypto that you were working on? What were, what was the what was that project all? It about? was called Meros. It was heavily inspired by Nano, if you ever heard of Nano. Yeah. Uh, Nano intending to be instant and feeless. Meros was going to be a similar thing, yet we were aiming to have a more well-defined consensus. We were aiming to solve some distribution problems they had, uh, and also provide a more efficient protocol. So it was just meant to be a bunch of improvements, but I spent over three years on it, and the fact it's still not complete kind of says I bit off a bit more than I can chew, which is why with my current work, I'm looking at a lot more manageable tasks than building a cryptocurrency from scratch alone. <laughs> what what initially sent you down that road? Was it you, you were into Nano and you wanted to improve on it, or what was the... Uh... Nano was great. It's had its issues, and Nano was currency. And as I said, when I first got into cryptocurrency, that's why I did it. It wasn't, oh, I want Ether so I can buy a crypto kitty, which wasn't even out at the time. It was, I was told I could get money for Ether. And it turns out Newegg will let me buy computer parts with it. <laughs> and I felt that Nano being instant and feeless. And in theory, there's a lot of practical conversations and this was years ago. But I felt Nano best epitomized currency at the time. It's had its problems since, but I was working on building a solution. And at the time I said, Monero makes more sense as holding funds long-term, moving funds around, not necessarily for day-to-day -day payments, but there's obviously a lot you can do with Monero, a lot of strong points to it. And I've increasingly believed that privacy is critical. So definitely come around to preferring Monero for my currency of choice. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so you weren't even trying to uh, embed privacy into your project at the time? That wasn't a, a main design goal? It wasn't. It was really aiming to be a currency. Um, Nano has a proof-of-stake protocol, simplest way to call it. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion still. Yeah. Um, but accordingly, they can't really have privacy because they need to know amounts to know how the network's organized. So one of the things we did is, while working on security, we actually split... We had a proof of stake token and a standard currency. See, it had a lot of interesting ideas in it, but they weren't exchangeable. It was that you mine it so we get the proof of work distribution, but it can be used with the speed and secure security of proof of stake, really just this insane system. And because of that, I noted like, well, because our currency isn't used in consensus. Yeah, we could just make that private if we wanted to. And it was something I wanted to work towards, but I didn't have the resources to tackle it. And one of the things I actually said when I kind of said, yeah, this project is a book of my life I'm closing for now. I said, if I wanted to continue, I think it would have to be private. And at the time, I didn't trust myself to be able to successfully integrate privacy. Oh, but if I did, it would have been Ring CT, honestly, because it's the way to go. <laughs> awesome. Why do you say that? Why is Ring CT the way to, the way to go? At the time, uh, Halo 2, which is Zcash's latest work, which I have a whole other set of tangents about. Um, we, could, we, could it... for, we could talk for days, <laughs> I could tell already. I just want to keep making your break, but go, go, go ahead. Right, so Halo 2 wasn't, it was being discussed as a trustless setup, um, but they hadn't really released it yet. And accordingly, the comment was, if you want trustless privacy, the most efficient protocol out there is Ring CT. And something I truly believe is that cryptocurrency is 
at a fundamental part, I don't believe that cryptocurrency is mandates privacy. I believe it absolutely should have privacy. I think it makes little sense without privacy, but I don't think cryptocurrency mandates privacy. I think cryptocurrency mandates verifiability, the ability to use cryptography to ensure that all parts of it are correct and to independently guarantee it. And the trusted setup is a rejection of that. I understand why people advocate for it. I understand that at the time, trustless setups would absolutely not be feasible for Zcash. But Monero has perfect amount of privacy. And obviously, ring signatures are not perfect. We can talk about attacks on those for a while as well. But Monero was trustless. So it may not have been the best privacy technically, but it was also private by default and actually had people using the privacy technology and was verifiable. And I respected all of those aspects. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying the the that's a more core principle to what a crypto needs to be. And... Right. And then Monero's privacy, it still is comprehensive. While I'm not here to say, okay, let's do ring signatures and call it a day. We definitely have improvements there. There's definitely discussions. I am here to say that Monero definitely gives you amount of privacy and it practically gives you center receiver privacy. While there are certain transaction behaviors, we can say exchanges or the government or firms or whoever you want to throw in that bag could identify. If we're talking about payments between each other, not sending to exchanges to exchange for other things, which obviously has to happen at some point. But if we're talking about buying goods and services, Monero is private for that. And I appreciate that. So what do you... What do you how do you view Monero in light of other cryptos? Uh, do you, is it like Monero is like the, you know, the one that's, that's good for, for cash like purposes and you use the other cryptos for other things. I'm just curious what your overall, <laughs> you know, take is yeah. on crypto and how you're looking at the scene. So Monero would definitely be my preferred cash candidate just because it's private by default. We, don't have the Zcash problem of having to shield. Uh, Ethereum has a lot of its own advantages, but the only way you get privacy on that is with Tornado Cash, which I think costs you $100 to withdraw at one point. I think I actually got 0.1 Ether notes trapped in Tornado Cash because the withdrawal fee was 0.09 Ether. <laughs> um, and... When you were 15, man, when you're... Jesus. What, well, what... no, I put them in, like, I think in 2018 or 2019, and then... They were 0 uh, 0.1 tornado either. Cash didn't even exist then, right? Um, I think it did exist in 20. I don't remember. But I put them in before the 2021 bull run. And then 2021, I'm like, oh, these are worth a few hundred dollars now. I can't withdraw them. <laughs> so that was the whole thing. Um, but Monero, I think anything, any option advertised as a cash alternative needs privacy. And I think anything advertised as a cash alternative has to be simple to use. I don't believe having privacy that isn't by default is simple to use. And I don't believe not having privacy is privacy. So Monero for that, but I still appreciate the versatility of Ethereum. I do hold a decent bit of Ether. When I had cryptocurrency, at least I thankfully got out. <laughs> but uh, Smart man. Wow. Well, I still hold some, some Monero, you know, never know when we yeah. need cash. Yeah. Exactly. So, it always makes sense to hold Monero, right? It, it, exactly. Yeah, speculation. Especially because it bucks the market a bit. And then how, how about Bitcoin? What's what's your take on Bitcoin? Where do you where do you see Bitcoin? What role do you see Bitcoin playing? If you want to discuss the digital gold, that one I'll give to Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. How about the whole fungibility thing and you know, Monero people such as myself say gold needs mm -hmm. to be fungible, Monero is fungible. Well, gold bars are numbered. <laughs> We can get into that. And I'm not trying to say Bitcoin is great. I'm not trying to say you should pay people with Bitcoin. But I'm also not suggesting you go to a grocery store and be like, hey, can you cut off a piece of this ingot? <laughs> I think there's distinctions there. And you can argue the lack of utility for Bitcoin means it's not a good store of value because you can't use it. And But if we look at the markets, Bitcoin's still number one. And if someone just wants to get into Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general, and they're not here to download a wallet, they just hear about the news, want to be part of it. If they're just going to keep their funds on their exchange, I don't want to hear that they lose 90% to Doge or Shiba Inu. I'm going to say, just get some Bitcoin. And 
if you want to withdraw, I have a recommendation called Monero, but definitely want to keep it simple. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, all, all great points. So do you see uh, Bitcoin and Monero competing or just complementing each other? How, how do you view that? Uh, until Monero overtakes Bitcoin, <laughs> um, I see them as complementary. One of them kind of makes sense as a more stable, well-known, widely used asset, unfortunately, even if one of them is better for usage. But one of them actually meets the, the intended user experience of cryptocurrency. And I believe when a lot more people realize the risk of the, the Bitcoin experience, they'll, they'll want to switch over. <laughs> Yeah, I believe uh, Cake commented that at the Bitcoin conference in Florida, most people chose to get their funds in Monero. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, we're we're seeing amazing. I I feel like uh, amazing growth with Monero in terms of actual, you mm -hmm. know, adoption for the use of digital cash purposes. So it's uh, it's exciting to watch. What do you see as being like Monero's greatest, you know, weakness? Like, what's your criticism of, of Monero? Uh, criticisms. There's reasons I was drawn to Nano. It was instant. It was feeless. I understand, of course, microscopic fees are microscopic, but I still believe they create a negative experience in a few ways. And if someone could successfully solve proof of work spam proofs, I believe that they would be better. But Nano, the premier currency there, hasn't solved them. So I understand why we're still on a fee system. Regarding Monero itself, though, I can also talk about the user experience of the 10 block lock, which is frustrating and led to a few different techniques. But I think its biggest issue would have to be with the privacy of ring signatures. It is saying it's one out of 11 transactions, you know, 9% odds or with the new protocol, one out of 16. And the unfortunate fact is that they're not even. The current selection algorithm, it uses some statistics thing called a gamma distribution, not really my specialty. I have to point to Rechnium for that one. But um, yeah, it could be that you select a minor transaction for one of your decoys. And people can say, well, we don't believe this person's mining Monero. Therefore, that's likely not the output they spent. And there's just a lot of discussions like that. And it's not only why we're increasing the ring size, but also why we're looking at uh, much, much larger ring sizes, like 64, 128 with Seraphis. And also why we're discussing getting rid of rings for something complete, where we should say it's one of the outputs on the blockchain. We're not saying it's one out of 11. We're not saying it's one out of 16. We're saying it's one out of one, of, like just, any one of them, but that's a much more complicated topic. I don't see us solving immediately. You think we ultimately move in that direction though? We deprecate uh, ring signatures and move on to a, a new tech? I think it's inevitable. Well, I think we, I think with Seraphis, um, we will have sufficient ring signatures. I think, would you rather have 128 outputs or millions? I think that even if it's more computationally expensive, the privacy is going to be unparalleled and much more secure overall. So I think the question is when, not if. Mm -hmm. When when do you think, yeah, in terms of ring signature amount, is there, uh, you know, a number where you think it, it does, you know, the kind of law of diminishing returns where it's like you're, you're you can't get much more private, uh, than that? like you, you approach something <laughs> Definitely a question for Rucknium. I think if I misrepresent misrepres any statistics here, they're going to yell at me for misrepresenting statistics, saying developers always do this. <laughs> um, but I do remember we had one discussion, I believe, about... I was trying to ask what's kind of like the minimum amount of rings we have. If we advance our research and our selection algorithm, which we are working on improving, um, if we just jump in time a year from now, and I believe my question was, how many or members in the ring would we need so you could only guess with 25% likelihood? Like, we may have 10 people in the ring, which should be 10% if it was perfect, but because of 
random Coinbase transactions, a few other like, oh, this was created 10 minutes after this one. Like there are, or 20 minutes because it's a 10 block. There are some things you could do to reduce that set. So if I said like, if I just select and outputs, how many do I have to have with the modern selection algorithms? So you can only guess with 25% likelihood. And I believe their answer was roughly eight. And I'm not trying to misrepresent them and I'm absolutely not trying to stand by it. But I found that notable because it said in a worst case, if you wanna say it's more likely than not that whoever is doing their best got it wrong, you only need eight outputs. If I'm remembering this correctly, obviously it was a rough back of the hand discussion. So I think as we discussed moving to 16 with the new selection algorithm, that's gonna be a great step. And I think if we move to 64 or 128, it's going to be already infeasible. I mean, if you really, really mess it up, maybe, but I think we're going to be without issue with 64 or 128. And moving to the complete set is just because why stop there? Why not offer better privacy to our users and remove the difficulty that is dealing with all of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's important to remember from, you know, uh, not, not not speaking to you, but to people listening. Oh, good. Okay. Um, you know that it, the ring signature is just one at is you know one aspect mm -hmm. of Monero's privacy, right? So it's just the obfuscating the sender, uh, and then there's other technologies that obfuscate right. the, the amounts and uh, the receiver. So it's um, it's a, you know because pe people when when they criticize Monero in terms of its technology, they attack ring signatures, but it's almost as though they're disregarding the, these other mm -hmm. aspects to Monero. It's why I tried to highlight Monero has perfect amount privacy. And as we look towards Seraphis, it gets actually really interesting because right now we have Ring CG, which we're still using very similar techniques in Seraphis. Seraphis isn't like this complete replacement. We're still going to have bulletproofs. We're still going to have the CT part of Ring CT. We're just replacing what we currently consider a ring with a different, close enough, with a different ring. But the interesting thing about Seraphis, instead of ring CT, it's almost a bit more like ring plus CT, which is a poor way of describing it. I'm sure Ko can yell at me later. But whereas the current uh, proof that we use for inputs, it's an out, it's a thing called CLSAC. It specifies both the ring signature part of it and it hides the amount you're spending. With Seraphis, that's actually moved into two different parts. We get one that one part that does the ring, one part that does um, amounts. Kind of, it's complicated. I'm sorry, I'm not explaining this well. But my point was trying to be, it's more Seraphis right? increases it's more modularity, yeah, yeah. right? And the advantage of that, I also messed this up because no, this is still that same proof. There's just a different aspect that's split out. I'm sorry, a bit nervous, I guess. Um, Doing great. I'm, with, I'm loving this. So I'm sure people watching it or listening will, will love what it. What I really wanted to say is that with Seraphis, if we did discuss moving to a complete privacy protocol and removing the ring aspect of it, it could still be done under Seraphis. We could still keep bulletproofs for the outputs. We could still keep uh, the other parts of Seraphis we're discussing. It's solely be replacing this one ring algorithm with a new algorithm, which is called a membership under Seraphis. Mm -hmm. Basically say, I'm spending an input, which is a member of the transaction set. Yeah, the other thing with, with ring signature, and I, maybe you, you mm -hmm. kind of already touched upon, you were saying a lot of things, uh, is the fact that, you know, it's, it, it isn't moon math, right? So uh, Zcash, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what they're working on is, is fantastic in theory, and it seems mm -hmm. like they've, they've figured it out. Uh, but you're, you know, it's not as reviewed and audited as something as like ring signatures to the point where we know exactly what's going on under the hood and what can go wrong, right? I'll take a halfway stance on that. Okay. Well, I'll definitely agree that Zcash does a lot more experimental and academic work, which has had its issues. Um, their first privacy protocol, as part of its trusted setup, they had to generate a bunch of variables and they saved a bunch of those variables as needed for the proof. But they saved one variable that they didn't actually need. And because they saved it, you could break the proof. <laughs> you could kind of break the setup. And it was this whole thing. Um, so 
I'm not trying, but also that's kind of just having a trusted setup. It's not necessarily that they were doing new work. It's that they messed up an implementation and it was, it was noted in the paper, save this. And it was just never caught. So yes, there is some degree of that, but Halo 2 is actually an evolution of Bulletproofs from my understanding, where Bulletproofs is what we already use in Monero. Um, so if we, uh, I only know this because I was actually working on implementing Bulletproofs in Rust earlier. Um, <laughs> but you are all over the place, my man. I love it. <laughs> bulletproofs. They are described as range proofs, where range proofs are what we use in Monero. It says, when you go to send money to someone, I'm sending you a valid Monero amount. I'm not sending you infinite Monero. Right. Because if we discuss computers, they have a fixed amount of numbers. And if you add one to a number at its max capacity, it does something called overflow, where if you have a highest possible number and you add one, it goes back to zero. It doesn't error. It just goes back to zero. It's called an overflow. Um, the same thing can, if we didn't cover this, happen with Monero outputs. You can send infinite money and then add one. And it's like, oh, yep, guess you have zero. Okay, so you spent zero dollars. How much more do you want to spend? So we have something called a range proof that says, no, they're not spending infinite money. They're spending a valid amount. And therefore, you can't achieve an overflow because you can never spend so much that you get up to this very high number. Mm -hmm. um, but the bulletproofs, which are advertised as a range proof, mm -hmm. they're technically defined as an arbitrary program. And that they're just like, by the way, we give this very simple range proof program that you can use to verify a number is in a range. But, you know, if you also just wanted to, you know, do ZK snarks over it, I guess you could. <laughs> And I, from my understanding, um, their new protocol, uh, Halo 2, or their new proving system, the protocol is known as uh, Orchard, mm -hmm. um, is an evolution of Bulletproofs. Oh, wow. So, That's an interesting way of, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're both zero knowledge proofs, right? Right. Uh, but they're they're closely related is what you're saying. It's kind of like, I'm not, it's kind of why I'm not liking the Snarks branding, because one, a lot of things are CK. And then two, most of the papers I see nowadays aren't using the term snarks. I don't believe Bulletproof uses the term snarks. What they describe is arithmetic circuits. Basically, the ability to do plus, minus, multiply within the Bulletproof, which is zero knowledge. And according to that, you can do a bunch of programs. Because there's some really interesting math here, but probably best to leave it for another time. <laughs> Dude, I am loving this, man. I am. Like, what? What? <laughs> good thing crypto. What would you do if crypto didn't exist? I feel like you would. You would be the guy that you would be Satoshi Nakamoto. If <laughs> didn't yet already. <laughs> I'd probably be bored. <laughs> but, um. So wait. What do you? So then, what do you think about Zcash versus Monero? So Zcash is moving towards this technology, which, which you know, um, is something that 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 could be great like from what you're saying there's no reason why we, we shouldn't believe it it, it, it can be trusted uh, but do you think zcash itself is fundamentally flawed you're saying because it started with the trusted setup initially or are, what is your current take on zcash i guess my current take is that it has a variety of organizational issues which greatly hold it back uh, they have this because they're a Bitcoin fork, so they do have and they do have transparent transactions. And as part of that, they have something called turnstiles. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike Monero, which has two privacy pools currently, we have pre ring CT and ring CT. Uh, and when we introduced bulletproofs, it was still ring CT. When we introduced CL SAG, it was still ring CT. When we do all of these optimizations, it's still ring CT until Seraphis, which will finally be a new pool. But we're hoping to keep that one as well until we become post-quantum. <laughs> um, Zcash, with each new protocol evolution, they create a new pool. And with the amount of research and work they do in between their pools, it can be justified. Our move to Seraphis is comparable to some of their moves. So as part of this, they have Sprout, they have Sapling, and now they have Orchard. When you move funds from sprout to sapling or sapling to orchard they do reveal the amount which i understand why even if i 
don't appreciate it. Um, <laughs> the thing is, is that because of this, they're able to implement something called a turnstile, where if the Sprout pool has 100, uh, 100 Zcash in it, and someone's like, oh, hi, I'm here to withdraw 101, they may legitimately say they have 101 Zcash in the Sprout pool. And then that works like, nope, not enough funds in the pool. Bye. So if the Sprout pool, which is the one that had the trusted setup issue all the way back in the day, if that was successfully compromised, mm. then only the funds in the Sprout pool are at risk, which are either A, dead funds, B, not compromised because they're still there, or C, the person who time locked their funds for 100 years in some Swiss fault is going to be very disappointed about it in 100 years. Mm -hmm. But I don't think Zcash is fundamentally broken just because it historically had a trusted setup thanks to that, even though it does come at the cost of privacy. I think Zcash has organizational problems in the fact that it still has transparent transactions and the fact that they're moving to increase privacy in wallets, but I don't feel they're giving adequate time to tackling removing transparent transactions entirely. Uh, their new work isn't under a recognized open source license. I believe it does meet the definitions of an open source license, uh, according to the uh, Open Source Software Initiative. And I don't mean to say otherwise, but I also believe it's an attempt at corporate control because it's a very strict license without a lot of community grants. And Zcash itself is still MIT, but only because the electric coin company issued an exception that says, oh yes, you can use our code, which can't be used with MIT software because we gave you special permissions, which the open source initiative says is not open source software. <laughs> and I also believe that they, they fail to collaborate with the community in some ways. There's a lot of success stories. I know a lot of people like it. I also seen wallets turned away because, oh no, we're doing something about that in-house. You don't have to worry about it. And then we wait a year and there's nothing or they would hear I actually dropped out of the Zcash community. But I know the feeling. <laughs> what, what do you think of like the the corporate aspect to it? They have Z Corp, obviously Zcash. That I'm also not a fan of. I can understand an organization. If you told me there was a 501c3, like I wouldn't really appreciate it, but I'd understand it and it wouldn't be a deal breaker. But I don't appreciate the corporation. Yeah, and how about like the dev tax? Do you think that's uh, a deal breaker or that's something that could be justified? It's just a different way of doing things. Dev taxes aren't the worst sin. Uh, I largely don't appreciate them. Um, one of the first times I was talking with uh, Justin Ehrenhofer of Cake, uh, we were just talking on a gaming call of all things. And... I, we were, of course, conversation goes to crypto. It's a crypto community. Why wouldn't it? And I bring up, oh, yeah, there's this one really great graph from years ago about Vail, who did a, like, 20% founder's reward and then 20% pre-mine as well. So they have, like, three different pre-mines and then their proof of stake. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's this really great graph on how proof of stake plus a dev tax just is a greatly increased dev tax because the dev tax we used to stay. And he's like, oh yeah, that's my graph. <laughs> and I was talking to the person who created it and I just didn't know at the time. Really just an insane moment. Um, Samsung Galaxy player. Yeah. He's a legend. And I think those dev taxes are horrible, but even my new work, we're not considering a dev tax per se, but we are considering a block reward skim to a DAO where the DAO isn't just, you know, me. It isn't just me and my best friend. And it's not just me and 10 elected people by our Discord community. No, we're discussing a product. If we do it, we would be discussing a proper consensus-driven votable DAO that anyone could participate in. But it would be funded by a block reward scheme. And considering Monero has had funding problems in the past and still has funding problems while we have an incredibly generous community and while i love the ccs and while i love magic for providing a more organizational and legally recognized approach which is why i'm happy to be on the monero committee for it um we still can't throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at a team of researchers and say yeah we can definitely get you an employment contract for the next year without issue and 
that's something groups with debt taxes can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of sins in a lot of places, but the reality is you have to make trade-offs. And the question is, how do we put the best foot forward, not for ourselves, but for our community? Awesome, man. So you started to touch on it there with uh, your project. Mm -hmm. which I think most people listening to this is probably what they're they're on the edge of their seat. This is what they want to hear about. Um, what what is the project you're working on for, for so Monero ecosystem? <laughs> it's called Sarai, and it's meant to be a decentralized exchange targeting Monero, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then also USDC and Dai, just to get USD options on there as well. Because no, we are not touching fiat. That is such a mess. <laughs> so while I do love atomic swaps and while I worked on atomic swaps in the past and while I'm still actually contributing some libraries towards atomic swaps and I still keep up to date on those conversations, I don't feel, as much as I hate to say it, as much as I love the technology, I don't feel the community actually wants atomic swaps, which is a brutal truth. We all say we want it. We all love the technology. We all want a trustless way to exchange funds. And Atomic Swaps is that. So we all want them. But if we look at Commit, I believe Commit did a few hundred to a few thousand dollars in volume a day. And if we look at BISC, BISC isn't trustless, and I don't mean to say it is. Um, but BISC is trusted in that it has a large community. It's existed for years. If you need to get funds, you're not likely to get scammed. And the notable part for me is it has a user interface comparable to atomic swaps because while BISC took, I'll go for a lot of shortcuts. While BISC listed a lot of projects by not listing them and instead doing a variety of techniques that like having a human click that yes, they receive the funds, which is also how they do bank transfers and fiat trades. Um, if you do a Monero Bitcoin swap, you can do it with no human interaction. And you're both supposed to be online. You have to wait for the Bitcoin to enter the multi-sig. Then you send them an arrow. Then you say you sent them an arrow. Then they do an automated check that they received it. And then they release the Bitcoin. And it creates a user experience very similar to atomic swaps. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe most users want to hear, oh, yeah, just open your laptop, download the app, you know, run it and do the swap and just wait half an hour. You know, it's going to take like 20 minutes for the Bitcoin to get mined and then you have to send them an arrow. And obviously there's going to be a better UX. So projects like Farcast are doing amazing work. I'm not trying to say the sole issue with BISC is the time period. I believe there's a lot of improvements we could do for Monero itself. But Commit fully automated this flow. And Commit was more meant for people of technical inclination. But I believe someone even made a website where you could atomic swap via the website alone. And it still failed to draw attention. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality we have to face is that while we have this technologically superior method, and while it's great if you ever want to do a large trade, it's great if you truly just need to be trustless, it's great if you're a privacy maximalist, there's a lot of reasons to be. And that's not a bad thing. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons atomic swaps are great. Most users just want to not run a node, not have to wait for 30 minutes. They want the sh shapeshift pioneered it. So I'll say them, they want the shapeshift experience. They want the change the experience. They want to click a button and then walk away and not worry about it. They don't care. They don't want to hear, oh yeah, your internet went out. So nope, guess you lost the funds. They just want to hear, yep, got your money. It came 30 minutes later. You didn't have to do anything. And that's what Sarai aims to cater for. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. In my, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish the thought. <laughs> what we do is we actually create a multi-sig wallet, which is similar to BISC and Half now, but they create two out of three wallets where if we were doing a trade, uh, you would create a key, I would create a key, and then someone from the BISC side of things, or it's not like a company, but you know, the BISC community would also create a key and we would do the trade. And if I have an issue, I'm like, hey, I sent Doug my money. Uh, he's not responding. I think he went to sleep for the night. Can you step in and you have the other part of the multi sig Can we get this done? And the arbitrator is like, yeah, nope, you sent the money. Let's get this done. While we use multi-sigs, we aren't doing it like that. What we do is we say, so I have part of this multi-sig. 
and so do 99 other people. <laughs> and any 67 of us can create a transaction. So you're going to send us money, but no, we're not going to make a new multi-sig with you. You're just going to send us money. <laughs> and we're a hundred people. We're trusted community members. We've put our own money into the system and we are trusted to execute on it. And I want to be clear about that because I don't want to misrepresent this. There is a trusted aspect, but also what we're discussing is getting a hundred individuals to put up thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, financially of dollars into the system to say, I will not steal. If I steal, you can kind of take this bond I put up. And therefore, this system will work as expected. There's the economic alignment in the game theory to make that happen. And that just means that you send it to the multi-sig and we run a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's going to be its own blockchain. And we acknowledge your trade and we just send out the funds. You don't have to worry about being online. You just have to make sure that you send your transaction and we handle the rest of it. And yes, again, it's trusted. But if we get a sufficient node count, considering that all nodes have to put up an economic bond to make sure they don't steal, it's worked for another project and I believe it can work without issue here. It also means that if you want to put up liquidity, if you want to say, hey, I like Monero, I have Monero, it's sitting in my wallet. What if I help other people get access to Monero? It means that you don't have to like run a node, like you don't have to run a BISC wallet 24 seven, you don't have to get a server and put your Monero into BISC or the commit server on a VPS. No, you can just deposit it, just kind of like a centralized exchange. So it's taking the ease of use and the UX of centralized exchanges while providing the simplicity of decentralized exchanges like Uniswap and keeping it decentralized overall, even for Bitcoin, Monero, Ethereum, where traditionally those haven't been decentralized with regards to exchanges. Awesome, man. <laughs> I love the way you're describing it too. So, I mean, the way I think, so there's there's centralized exchanges, then there's mm -hmm. like instant exchanges where you don't have to KYC, right. ML, and you're not holding. Then there's um, then there's things like uh, you know, there's there's local Monero, there's there's Bisc mm -hmm. and Havino. Then there's then I would say then there's there's you know you Sarai, and then after that is atomic swaps. Is that like a Interest, uh, accurate way of thinking about it in terms of like the spectrum of yeah I, I can kind of see what you're going for there <laughs> obviously there's a lot more to discuss especially when you consider instant exchangers kind of just immediately send their funds to centralized exchanges yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but right but what, just an overview so like right no no, no i get you and what's the difference between this and atomic swap right and all the others and... i think what's kind of notable is how we're trying to provide that instant exchanger experience in a decentralized fashion. Yeah, it's, it's the holy mm -hmm. grail. I mean, uh, you know, right. obviously atomic swaps, like you said, theoretically is, is better in terms of its mm -hmm. trustlessness. But you're like, you know, the market has is has spoken or is speaking and it, it's just mm -hmm. not usable enough to where it's drawing in users. I, and so there needs to be maybe some minor sacrifice of, of the pure trustlessness to... Right. Like dial up the knob on the usability side. I do want to note, BISC is, by cryptocurrency, there might be a different definition here. But in my opinion, while BISC did not live up to expectations, I do believe BISC is successful in that they took two years to adopt SegWit, and I'm still frustrated about that piece of history, <laughs> but BISC does have volume. BISC does have a group of contributors who are considered a team. BISC is successfully paying out people who contribute. And BISC is offering a functional exchange surface. So while BISC didn't make as much of an impact as we may have wanted in the decentralized community, I do see BISC as successful. And I don't want to say atomic swaps can't be successful. Mm -hmm. Just not my, right yet, maybe, perhaps. My belief is that even with its trade-off, the simplified UX has the likelihood to be an order of magnitude more successful. And it kind of saddens me, you know? And it's why I try to be brutally honest because I don't want to misrepresent any of this. I don't want to say, oh yeah, we're trustless. We're decentralized. We have an economic system that makes it literally cost money to steal from us. 
Doug, if you want to give me a thousand dollars, I'll let you take five hundred dollars from me. Okay, um, but technically, yes, there could be issues, and we have to acknowledge that. We have to be honest about it. But when it comes to value, this style has proven to be more successful, and it was going to occur to Monero at some point. And I wanted to step in and be the group who did it because. There's a couple other projects which are doing very similar schemes, and I wasn't personally happy with them. And well, I got to tell you, you're referring to Thor Chain, obviously. <laughs> there is one other candidate who has yet to launch, but mainly Thor Chain, yes. Um, while I could have built my own atomic swap project, uh, at one point I was working with Farcaster. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to keep up there. Well, I, uh, well, I could have done a few things. I didn't appreciate a few aspects with ThorChain, which at the time I started this had moved their integration into testing. And I kind of said, this is the reality and this service will be provided to Monero. And I do believe there is a legitimate service here and I don't mean to say otherwise. But I believe that when we're discussing the service of multi-sig offering efficient swaps, great UX, I believe I can build a better service. So if someone's going to offer the service Ideally, we offer the best service, not just one that's acceptable. <laughs> so Sarai is really the, the same concept as Thor. It's not, it's not different in concept. It's just uh, a different... Uh, I have a lot of technical notes. <laughs> what would you say are, are the, the primary differences between the, the two projects? Well, yes, we are very similar in concept. And that was one I'll have to acknowledge. I think if you told me I have five seconds to explain Sarai, I think I probably would have to use the word Thorchain. Um, we're not only aiming at launching with Monero and being just a very strong supporter of that ecosystem, but we're looking at a much wider distribution and we're looking at much more efficient protocol decisions. So a wider distrib distribution of, of the coin? That, yeah. Right. So economic bond, in order to be practical, requires a new coin, which is kind of stupid, but it's also kind of the truth. Because we could say, okay, let's have the bond be in Bitcoin. So now we have people bonding Bitcoin. Okay. So someone needs to hold this bond to hold them accountable. Okay. Well, we have a multi sig. Let's just send the Bitcoin to the multi sig. So if someone steals the multi sig, they're also stealing the bond <laughs> that we're supposed to use to pay for any thefts. It's trusting a group to be self-accountable. Well, we just said we need to hold them accountable. And because of that, the principle <laughs> which is they have to put in a bond of the token because if someone steals from the network, the token price will plummet accordingly. And the fact that the token goes to zero is why they lose their bond. And that is a death case, which is not appreciated. But when you actually create multiple validator sets, so you can have like one group doing the Bitcoin, one group doing the Monero, which also means that you can participate in Sarai without having to run every node. You just run the node that's relevant to the coins that you're offering to the network. Hmm. It means even if we did lose all our Bitcoin, we could take the Sarai from the Bitcoin group. And now we still have Ethereum. We still have Monero. And because we still have active markets and we still have liquidity, Yes, we can successfully transition that to returning value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's there's a few economic discussions here as well, but with Thorchain, over fifty percent of their supply went to centralized parties at the start, mm -hmm. and then I think seven percent was offered up in their initial token sale, uh, which was still one of the things. I, I have a list of grievances. Some all state, some that are sufficiently petty. I'll keep to myself. Some I have to keep private. Um, but that's just one example. They made decisions that they thought was best for whatever reasons. And I come from Monero where we don't really like free minds and I love that Monero doesn't have one. So while we are still discussing some allegations, we're trying to keep them minimal and trying to make sure that they actually have the community's best interests. We're not trying to have 50% of the supply go to investors and the team at the start. So um, we should say, so you you did some work for ThorChain, right? Didn't you like uh, basically kind of audit them or something? Or I submitted a critical bug bounty to them. Oh, wow. Okay. So, right. 
And that would be another one of my career fan says. Uh, there's been a few projects. I think Tezos was kind of the first group to do this. Mm-hmm. Was, was it Tezos that did Alphanet? Or... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I think Tezos was one of the first groups to do this. They had like Alphanet when they first launched. And they're like, no, no, there's money in it. We're just calling it Alpha. So if it gets hacked, we're not at fault. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you're telling people to put money in it. You're still at fault. <laughs> and Thorchain did something similar called ChaosNet. And while I'm not trying to say, with this point alone, I'm not trying to say Thorchain should have launched with it. With other points, I'll say that. Um, with this point alone, I'm not trying to say Thorchain shouldn't have released a product when it did. Um, I believe that they should have acknowledged as a mainnet. I don't believe that calling it chaos net is a sufficient warning to users when their apps didn't say, you know, oh, by the way, this is chaos net. All funds are expected to be in a state of chaos. You should not be trusting this without extensive review. They just said, great, you want to deposit? And so that's a very slight branding thing. And you can say that's petty. But also, they actually move, they officially announced a mainnet while my exploit wasn't fully patched, if I recall correctly. <laughs> so I don't believe that they've treated security fairly in the past. They've been hacked a few times accordingly. Then they shut down the network and held funds for a couple of months while the network was down because it's in a multi-sig. They've called it uh, trustless swaps that are non-custodial. When, no, if it was non-custodial, you could it you would be able to get your funds when the network was down for two months and not only have they had historical security issues i think just two months before i did my report another bug bounty was found where you could get bitcoin sent to you three times instead of the amount there's a long list of security issues and i don't believe their team has done an appropriate job with them in the past and the fact that I found yet another critical issue recently, which was complex, and I understand why it was there, but also the fact that they finally did move to mainnet while also having admin controls. I think they actually used my uh, disclosure as reason to add yet another admin control. There's a long list of statements here. <laughs> well, you, you're, you're the you're the perfect guy to make Sarai, right? You know, you know what all the problems are. I, I right. love that you ha- have, uh, you know, the true open source Monero minded uh, mm-hmm. nature to you, and you're you're you're, you're implementing that. Seem, it seems like mm-hmm. in the design of this project, it seems like you're really trying to, uh, you know, make sure you you, you stay true to the to the value right. of crypto. And go ahead. As much as I'd want to be. I'm not here to be a Puritan. I said I'm not doing atomic swaps. I said there is still some level of custody here. It's decentralized. We're hoping to get it up to 100 nodes. We're hoping, you know, we have this economic and game theory, but there are issues here. And no matter how you look at it, it's a rise of compromise. But it's the reality of where we are. I mean, we can say Monero's compromise is you. I send money to you and I can't do more for 20 minutes. We have ring signatures. We're incredibly proven, but... They have their own privacy issues because they're not complete. And it's finding what's best that works for the community. And while I can't say that we're going to be the next note free mind, proof of work, you know, 100% community distributed, I'm not trying to say that. But what I am trying to say is I'm here to do my best for the community, which did do that. Awesome, man. And and when you say that, you know, there there are sacrifices being made it's it's basically the it isn't truly non-custodial that's what you see as being the biggest, the biggest yeah issue with this tech mm-hmm. and it's really why i want to raise such awareness to it just because yeah we have to be honest about these issues when we were discussing monero earlier i love monero i said that but i also said yeah there's some things you can do with privacy uh and our ring signatures to reduce the amount of privacy But I also said we're working on that because we acknowledge our problems and we don't stop there. We work to make it better. Well, this this approach is certainly working. Uh, I think when when you when you post it in the community, Mm -hmm. I didn't really see much negative. You know, you normally usually see one or two complete like attacks. (laughs) Uh, You know, knock on wood, you you didn't get attacked. There was mostly people embracing that you're you're working on this tech. I think the largest criticisms were, you know, why why do we need a new coin? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we could be. You I also think we've had a few exchange announcement recently. So I think people, uh, we've had a few different exchanges announced recently. Okay. So 
I think people might have been a bit tired. Um, there was half an O, and then there's, of course, still Forecaster, which announced that it's hoping to hit mainnet soon. Mm-hmm. And then I believe Particle released Basic Swap. Like, they announced Basic Swap, like, a week before I did my announcement. <laughs> oh, I didn't pick up on that one. Particle. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, no, it was another one. They're they're a smaller project, but they're doing their own the, implementation of atomic swaps. Community swaps. off guard. You caught the community at a good time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry. I'm sure I'm sure you'll get attacked plenty. Don't worry about that. But you, well, you to be have we considered like listing Zcash? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, I, I I do think Avano um deserves a bit more respect. Uh, I do have my own comments on it that I think are a bit past the scope of this, but. I'm sure I wouldn't get attacked if I made that decision. <laughs> Let, wait, can we hear a little bit about your take on it, Havino? I think I think Sarai isn't doing a CCS proposal, not only because I have the ability to build it with my own resources uh, and the resources from a recent critical bug bounty I submitted. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I think even before that, I said I'm not doing a CCS because as much as I respect the CCS as community crowdfunding, it brings in drama. And when you do a CCS, everyone who put in funds believes they have a say in the output of your work because, oh, I funded it. You know, I'm the one who let you do this. And I believe when you do a CCS, Monero thinks they own your project to some degree. Yeah. Um, I personally... I think that Havano should have tried to get money for the Zcash listing because they said they didn't. And I do believe them. And I understand the moral side. Yeah, we're not taking money for listings. And I respect that. But also Zcash has money. They have a lot of money. They'll give it to you. <laughs> I spent a few months over there in their forums talking with them. They will give you money. <laughs> and it's like, I understand why you came to the Monero community for money. Because it was the right thing to do. We were building a service for Monero. We have a community crowdfunding system. Projects should use it. Zcash also has a funding system. They have a lot more money than us. So I kind of think that Havido should have gotten the Zcash money. But I also don't think that there's an issue with listing Zcash as an option. I don't personally uh, appreciate Bitcoin Cash. I didn't like it when it came out. At this point, I'm neutral. I appreciate parts of it. I'm not going to be moving over from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash. But I still want to have it as an option because there are people who like Bitcoin Cash and I want to give them the access to Monero. I despise Solana. I consider it corporate crypto. But no one's integrated Solana into a decentralized exchange yet, really. There's been, of course, bridges and all those. But I haven't seen atomic swap work there. And then ThorChain, I believe, consist- considers it too high bandwidth at this time. And it is absolutely brutal. I'm not even sure we would do it. But I want to consider it because that means... Anyone in Solana can access Monero directly. And I'm not trying to say I like Solana, but if someone in Monero wants Solana, okay, you can use Sarai or you can use Kraken. I I guess I'd rather use a decentralized exchange. So I don't think Havano should have gotten flack for listing Zcash. I don't believe they should have been attacked for being paid for it. I do believe they weren't. Uh, I also think they should have gotten the money for it. (laughs) But I respect the fact that they wanted to do listings without taking money. I respect that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I believe there was some criticism available for about it in the sense that Zcash was discussed without money and Monero was discussed with community funding because it was advertised as a Monero supporting project and kind of as a Monero project in some ways. Mm -hmm. But I respect the moral stance they wanted to take and I don't believe Zcash should be cut off from the ecosystem. Uh, though now that it's kind of corporate licensed, I am no longer <laughs> dealing with Zcash, but that wasn't the discussion at the time. That came after. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.